Another year, another budget tabled in the House of Commons, and another rubber stamp vote on the horizon. Experts across the country lament the state of Parliament's real ability to scrutinize the billions of taxpayers' dollars spent. Here now to tell us what happened to Parliament's power of the purse and what can be done to reclaim it in the nation's capital. Peter DeVries, former director of the Fiscal Policy Division in the Department of Finance. And Laurie Turnbull, professor of political science at Dalhousie University. And with us here in studio, Mel Cat, former clerk of the Privy Council, now professor in the School of Public Policy and Governance at the U of T. And of course, we welcome back the former parliamentary budget officer, Kevin Page. Good to have everybody with us here in the studio. Mel, nice to have you in and in Points Beyond. Lori, I want you to get us started here because I think I learned in high school once upon a time that responsible government meant that Parliament basically controlled the purse strings. It was Parliament's responsibility. What does that actually mean? Okay, so responsible government is supposed to mean that the government has to have the confidence of the House in order to govern legitimately. So one of the really important facets of that is that the government needs Parliament's approval in order to spend money. So nothing should be spent without Parliament having scrutinized it, having understood it, and having given an you know, informed consent to it. So that's pretty, that's pretty much what it's supposed to mean. Peter, does Parliament in fact do that today? Uh, I guess most of us would argue that they don't do that today. Uh, there's, uh, they go through the motions of presenting bills before the House of Commons uh, in order to approve the various components of spending. But very little time is actually spent by parliamentarians in, in looking at the details of those spending uh, requests. And in a majority parliament, of course, the, uh, the vote is automatic um, in favor of the government uh, receiving uh, approval for those spending estimates. Mel Cap, let me get your take. Do you think parliament does its job today the way it was supposed to? Um, I think Parliament actually has all the ability it needs without my good friend Kevin Page's uh, office. Do they exercise <laughs> that authority is a different question. So if you take the grand sweep of history and you think that Parliament or the Crown has had its powers constrained over history from 1215 in the Magna Carta in the 16th century, the role of Parliament, Parliament uh, is constraining government. Is it doing its job well? No, it's not. And could it do better? Yes, it could. MPs need to do their job. Why aren't they? Very good question. I mean, Kevin provides them with a lot of, or provided, with all due respect, a lot of uh, fodder. The Auditor General provides them with a lot of fodder. The Parliamentary Information and Research Service of the Library of Parliament provides them with a lot of analysis. The, the House has become so partisan that I believe they really don't look at the issues and in particular the spending as well as they should. Do you think members of parliament are doing the job that Mel Cap says they can but don't do? No, no, I, they're not doing the job, which so I agree with, with Mr. Cap. I think it, it's very rare that parliamentarians see what we call decision support analysis, which is the kind of analysis that you know, the legislature can use to hold the executive to account. And in my five year history, you know, some of the issues, whether war costing or fighter planes or ships, we were able to give them what I think we gave finance ministers and prime ministers in my day, but they almost never saw that type of information before. I think when you give them that information, you empower them to do their job. Lori, what am I missing here, though? Because I see financial subcommittees studying the budget document. I see the estimates committee going over things. Uh, it, it looks like there are members holding press conferences on every number of different things related to budgets. So what oversight role do ordinary MPs have that it looks like some of the time they're doing that you say they're not doing? Okay, well, I think part of the issue is um, some of the issues that the MPs have raised and some of the issues that were raised in the committee, uh, re committee report chaired by um, Martin. Some, uh, to an extent, some of the problems are that the MPs don't, are saying that they don't feel they get the information on time. Um, they're saying that they don't have really enough, enough time to scrutinize what's there. Um, part of the problem is that um, when we get when we see a budget come down, it doesn't match the budget estimates necessarily, and the budget really comes down as a kind of um, you know a policy statement, like it's always a very you know big ceremonious thing that everybody pays attention to on, when it's read in the House of Commons. But that's a very different thing again from an omnibus bill that can come later that actually tells us what's going to happen. So there seems to be some problems in terms of, of 
factors like that affecting MPs' ability to scrutinize effectively. But Mel, is it fair to say that we are in a different time now, that MPs are there in effect to be cheerleaders for what the Prime Minister and in this case the Minister of Finance does and that's just the way the game has changed? The game has changed a little bit in that regard, but in some respects it was ever thus. So we've seen uh, members of parliament, selected members of parliament, some of them who've taken their jobs seriously, who are prepared to challenge the government, uh, regardless of what stripe they happen to be, and study the estimates. I mean, if, as an official, I used to appear before parliamentary committees all the time, and uh, uh, it was much easier to go into the House of Commons than to the Senate. The senators actually studied the material, looked at it seriously, did a serious job. Members of parliament wanted to score political partisan points. So as an official, you could sit back and let the two sides go at each other. Whereas in the Senate, you had to actually know what you were talking about. So give me an example of that. How would, how would you, bring, you bring some information forward and, and how did it all play out between the scoring well, the, points? Well, in, in the day uh, when Pete was in, uh, in finance and Kevin uh, in finance and I was in the Treasury Board, I would take supplementary estimates into the Senate Finance Committee. Which means what? So every, the, as Laurie described, the government table's main estimates and then the budget now so that not all of the spending plan is, is put before Parliament in an Appropriation Act at the beginning of the year. And instead it comes back from time to time and says, we need you to vote more money for this or that specific project. Well, what happens is, this is an opportunity for members of Parliament or Senators to really delve into the matter. And for members of Parliament, they would sit there and bicker back and forth from a party perspective, whereas the Senate would actually get into it and challenge officials and say, well, how is this money really going to be spent? Hmm. And, and I found that really refreshing and more difficult as an official because I had to know what I was talking about when I would answer. This is the first positive thing I've heard about the Senate in months, maybe uh, years. I'm a big fan. You are. Especially of an appointed Senate. Oh my gosh, that's another show for another day. Peter, can you tell me during your experience whether it seemed to you as if members of parliament were more interested in scoring partisan political points as opposed to doing quote unquote their jobs? Well, I have to agree with Mel on this one here. Um, when I would appear before the House committees, uh, it was normally a, a cakewalk. Um, you, you prepared yourself accordingly, but very rarely were you asked any questions of substance. In the Senate, however, you had to be on, on, your, on your best game. Um, they knew the stuff better than you knew it in many cases. And I'm part of it because the senators had been following government spending for many, many years. There was a number of senators who um, had come up the ranks, knew exactly what each department spent their money on, where the, they say the fault lines were, um, where they wanted to, to push you on. Uh, whereas in the House of Commons, it's a co completely different uh, script altogether. The members are there, in some cases, for less than four years. They get rotated out of the committees on a regular basis. They don't have the background knowledge in order to delve into the main estimates the way that the senators do. Um, and there's just not as much time for them to spend on, uh, on the main estimates and the supplementary estimates than they have in the Senate. So no, I agree fully with Mel, is that you had to be prepared when you went into the Senate to answer the questions uh, posed by the senators. They did a much better job uh, than those in the House of Commons. Hmm. Kevin, when you were the parliamentary budget officer, which you were until just a few days ago, I wonder whether you saw empowering members of parliament to do their jobs as part of your mandate. That was my mandate. And um, I, I, I feel that often members of parliament, both on the House side and, on, and senators, didn't understand their jobs completely. I feel that we've made documents so complicated that they struggle going from budgetary documents to the estimates documents. And I think many new members of parliament, they come to, you know, they come to parliament and you know, they're frustrated with the fact that they can't change these documents. They can't make strong recommendations that will allow these, you know, the estimates, supplementary estimates that Mel used to bring to committee uh, you know, to change. And they, they, they find it complicated. They vote on these big votes like operations and capital and transfers when they understand programs, you know, like, you know, like border infrastructure funds or ice breaking. And they, I think they see as well, if they're on the opposition side, that the playing field is nowhere near level, that the executive has, you know, the opportunity to speak to Peter DeVries or Mel Cap, but they don't have the same cast of thousands to support them, even though their role as power of the purse, which Laurie talked about, is absolutely vital. So, Laurie, has government simply become the, the, the simple, everyday operational machinery of government? Is it just far too complex for any ordinary member of parliament to keep up with? 
Um, I would have, it's very complex. Um, and I would think that when, you know, when you decide you want to run for office and you want to go to parliament, it's because you want to make a difference, right? You want to weigh in on these questions. You want to have a really clear understanding of what's going on. You want to be able to make very informed votes. But then you get there and you realize, well, you've got, you know, a million and a half things to do. And the information that's probably most important is also the most complex and it's not something that you can get your head around really quickly and at the same time you know our media have become far more focused on um, you know kind of non-stop coverage and any kind of slip up that an MP might make or you know even more so that a cabinet minister or a prime minister might make and so at the same time that government is becoming more complex there's more intense scrutiny of the MPs themselves mm -hmm. so I don't, I don't envy an MP trying to scrutinize the budget. Mel Cap? Well, I, I agree with Laurie, and, uh, the, but there's something missing here because the, the political parties used to have research branches that did real research. Now the research branch prepares MPs for question period, and they don't do serious analytic work that used to be feeding the process of budget review, spending estimates review, of program ana analysis, that's a real political party problem that hasn't kept pace with modern uh, media, technology, and governance. They send you with talking points now. Uh, talking points may be helpful for MPs who can't think, but for MPs who need analysis on which to base their questions, doesn't much help. Peter, uh, I, I've heard this. Alison Lote from the Samara Foundation has come in here and talked about the exit interviews that she does with members of parliament who, who, who confess that they don't understand what their jobs are, that they get elected, they go to Ottawa, and they're not exactly sure what their job is supposed to be. How can that be that in this day and age, in a mature democracy in the Western world, that these people get elected and they don't really know what they're supposed to be doing? Well, that is a, that is a, a big surprise. I'm sure that if their constituents heard that, they would sort of wonder why they voted for them to go to Ottawa in the first place. But having said that, you know, it's up to the party in order to brief the MPs properly as to what their roles are. But then it's also up to the various institutions of Parliament in order to brief the, the individual members as to what it is that they are doing and how an MP can play into that. You take a look at all these parliamentary committees that have been set up, how much information is actually given to an MP beforehand in order for him or her to understand what their new roles or duties are going to be. And you take these various committees that examine the main estimates uh, and the supplementary estimates. How much information does a member who sits on that committee get before he actually delves into these estimates? I believe that they should have at least a day, if not more, sitting down with not only the, the overall committee, but sitting down with the various officials from the departments who are represented on that committee so they can understand what it is that the departments are, are are, are doing, how the main estimates fit into that, how the budget fits into that, and what role that they actually have that they could play and make a difference um, uh, when they appear before these committees. Well, Kevin, let's do a for instance on this. I wonder if in your five years as the parliamentary budget officer, you ever had a member of parliament come up to you and say, I want to understand better mm. what you've got in this report, but then they couldn't do anything with it because they feared that if they did, they would be adversely affecting their potential rising up the greasy pole on Parliament Hill. That happen? Well, it, it, we've had many briefings, almost daily briefings with members of Parliament after, certainly after big reports on crime bills and fighter planes on ships. And we've had you know, briefings as well with backbenchers on the government party. And I would say, I, when we provided information to opposition members, they got it. They, you know, they would, you, it would become part of question period. It would be, become part of discussions in, in finance committees, operations and estimates committees, et cetera. Clearly, I felt you know, that the, the, the backbenchers, so to speak, those conservative, government, conservative members that were not part of the executive, they struggle at committees to, to, to go beyond t the talking points that Mr. Cap talked about. Why was that? Well, I think they, it's a sense that you know they're the all they need to be the, that the alignment that they have to the executive, to the prime minister and cabinet was much stronger than the alignment they have to elected representatives. I think Pete was right. I think you know when we 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 send people from our our, our our writings and we want them to scrutinize spending, we want them to understand what's going on. But you know when they get there, if they're if they're government members but they're not sitting as part of the executive, they feel that they should be providing those communication talking points at committee and not scrutinizing spending. Mel Cap, let's just clarify here. I mean, we're talk we are talking a bit about the way it is today, but my hunch is people believe 
'twas ever thus. Now, when you were the clerk of the Privy Council, was it this bad? <laughs> um, I, 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 yes, I have a gray beard, but it's not that gray. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to sort of uh, put this in perspective. We're talking about MPs as if there was one MP. I mean, they all have different personalities. Some of them are actually really, really thoughtful and responsive and do uh, their homework and delve into matters deeply. Um, I can think of some in my time. When I was Deputy Minister of the Environment, the, uh, Charles Katcha was the chair of the committee. He was a model member of parliament because he struggled to know as much as any MP and as much as the minister would know and then challenge the minister and on And the prime minister of the day couldn't stand him for that. That's not true, actually. Uh, the prime minister of the day characterized him as a model MP. He hated what he was doing to his government. <laughs> well, there you go. But yeah. he, char he literally characterized him as a model MP because he did his homework. But at the same time, he hated what he was doing to his government. Uh, and Charles Katcha didn't, perhaps didn't go as far up the greasy pole as he could have because people knew he was trouble. He, he had been minister before and he recognized he was not going to be minister again. Right. And instead, he made a difference. This is all about effectiveness. How can you make a difference? One way of making a difference is do your homework. And some MPs even now do that. Okay, but Laurie, that story notwithstanding, you're in some respects making the point, which is if you do your homework and you do what the job of the MP really is supposed to be in terms of oversight, you're going to pay a price in terms of your career. What kind of message does that send to everybody? Well, sure, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be that way, but it seems like in our system, that's how it works out. Like, if you read sort of a textbook explanation of responsible government, it creates a dichotomy between, it creates a separation between the executive and the legislature. So you have the prime minister and cabinet on one side, and then you have the legislative branch, which you know includes all non-cabinet MPs holding the government to account. But that's not really how it works. Because of political parties and the party discipline that we've been talking about, there is a connection between the cabinet and then their caucus members who are not in cabinet. Mm -hmm. And so in a sense, is especially in a majority government situation, the government has a lot of protection against the scrutiny that we think parliament is supposed to be doing. And because of the amount of power and control that prime ministers have in Canada, they have a lot to offer MPs. You know, if you decide you're going to be that MP who, you know, who studies really hard and who comes in and really, you know, breathes life into the scrutiny role no matter what it, ha what it means for your government, that could mean you're not going to get the committee post you want, you're not going to get the cabinet position you want, you're not going to get, you know, whatever it is that the prime minister might give you. And so that's kind of a reality of political life in Canada. And right. if you compare it to um, the parliamentary system in Britain, for instance, there are so many MPs there that you don't have a realistic shot statistically of getting into cabinet. And so chances are you're going to spend your political life as a backbencher because there's just not enough room for everybody in cabinet. There's too many MPs. And therefore and so you take your leaders, oversight role more seriously? Theoretically you could, right? Like <laughs> arguably the discipline function works you know, it's, it's stronger in Canada than it is in the UK because the Prime Minister just has that ability to, to do the carrot and stick business and it doesn't work so well in the UK. Right. Let me, uh, you know what, I know we touched on this control room a bit in the one-on-one in the -on -one interview we did with Kevin earlier, but I think it's worth revisiting this. Let's play the Jim Flaherty clip if we can from Chapter 2 here because uh, I've got a few more questions about the uh, Parliamentary Budget Office. Uh, roll tape, please. I was there in those discussions in the early days of our government because I've been there since the beginning. Uh, the idea was that the parliamentary budget officer would kind of work like the congressional budget officer in the United States to report to the elected people in the House of Commons about how the government was doing in its budgeting, sort of being a sounding board, a testing board. He's kind of gone off that course and I, I think that course was the right course um, and, and, and it could be very valuable to members of parliament of all parties, including my own party. Um, but we've been, he's been kind of wandering off that and going in other places. I'll give you one more chance to take a poke at him if you want. Now's the time. No, but I, I think that's a changed view from uh, a political party that, that was in opposition that wanted an independent budget authority and a, you know, and a party that's now in power. And I mean, I don't think that's, that's just you know, going to, particularly to this particular government, I think governments across the world will feel the same way with respect to crea a creation of a legislative budget office.
No? Look, I, I really think the whole notion of having a legislative budget office is wrong. It's misguided because it undermines ministerial accountability and the way parliament should work and the way government, public servants, should be uh, accountable to parliament through a minister. Um, and so I, I thought Flaherty's comments about basing it on the Congressional Budget Office is instructive. We have a Westminster system. We do, you know, unless we import a president and a Congress, we shouldn't have a Congressional Budget Office. We should have the Department of Finance putting out um, uh, estimates of uh, fiscal and financial and economic forecasts that are going to be uh, held to account that they will be um, in the UK with a, a true with the Westminster system. Mm -hmm. uh, they have an office of budgetary responsibility, but it is accountable to the treasurer, to the chancellor of the exchequer, not to Parliament. So you object to the creation of his office to begin I with? I think it, uh, Kevin was the right choice, and uh, I think it was the wrong office. Interesting. Well, I wonder if because our because our politics have become so partisan. And because we appear to, at least polls say this, have so little faith in members of parliament today and so much faith in these independent officers of parliament, isn't that why we need him to do that job? Because MPs can't anymore. Okay, now I'm going to side with Flaherty. I mean, uh, Flaherty said that uh, he got slightly uh, off course. The, the legislation, and Kevin's quite right to go back to the legislation, talks about uh, financial and economic estimates. And the extent to which that is what you look at, it's fine. Kevin has, uh, took the office, and again, I have great respect for Mr. Page, but he took the office towards more of an, an Auditor General's office. We already have an Auditor General. The Auditor General did the F-35 review. The Auditor General has done similar reviews like on Afghanistan. Uh, I think that uh, we have what is now becoming the parliamentary posse of a whole bunch of uh, independent uh, agencies that swoop down after the battle and shoot the survivors. Okay, Sheriff, equal time for you. Well, I mean, we are not an auditor. I have no audit background, and we don't we don't look at things ex post. We look at things before money's being spent. So, you know, we provide our own independent projections on the economy, on the fiscal situation. We provide analysis as a deficit, cyclical, structural. Do we have long-term sustainability problems? These are our estimates, and so the legislature can, you know, they get an extra data point. There's never anything wrong with the data point on issues like the F-35 or crime bills or um, ships. Like the, in Ottawa, you had to come to the PBO to get an analytical paper that was peer-reviewed uh, with assumptions and models, and we put that analysis out. And you didn't get that from the government. And so perhaps we wouldn't need a priority budget officer if we had a public service that released that type of analysis, but they don't. And uh, so, I mean, that's a fundamental difference. We're not, we're not auditors. You know, again, we provide economic and fiscal projections and, 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 and analysis. And, you know, we've given something to Parliament that they weren't getting from the public service and they certainly weren't getting from the government. Let me get uh, Peter's view on this. Peter, again, the premise of this line of inquiry is that we don't trust our members of Parliament enough to do these jobs because politics have become so toxic. That's why Kevin's polling numbers are through the roof because he's more trustworthy than the people we send there to do the job. True or false? Well, let me go back a little bit to that clip you ran, uh, ran of Mr. Flaherty. I think he has rewritten history in some, some uh, aspects by stating what he did state. I had to sit through all of those finance committee hearings in which the, the opposition was clamoring for an independent budget officer uh, reporting directly to Parliament because it didn't trust the government at that point in time. And when you go back and you take a look at the 2006 election platform by the Conservatives, again, they promised an independent parliamentary budget office, not one that reports to the Prime Minister or the Library of, of Parliament, but an independent one that reports to Parliament. Um, of course, once they got into power and saw what that meant, they changed the script fairly quickly. I think that if, I have to agree with, with Kevin in the sense that if the public service was providing the information that Kevin is providing today, you wouldn't have a parliamentary budget office. Uh, when you take a look at the Department of Finance prior to 2006, they would release anywhere from 20 to 30 uh, working papers every year, papers that were prepared by the economists uh, uh, on various issues uh, and which they would defend then at conferences. Today you don't have any of that anymore. That's all uh, clamped down. Try today to get any information from any government department. 
you can't do it. Uh, whereas before, you could get information from, from the individual departments. In fact, when I was in finance, I had carte blanche access to, or the, the media had carte blanche access to me on any issues uh, on the budget and on the fiscal projections. Today, that's not there. And when you take a look at, at the, the budget itself, there are so many, how should I say, little nuances that uh, nobody understands until such time as the budget omnibus bill comes out. Uh, so you need someone in order to, to look over these government um, promises, uh, to look over the, the estimates that they do, to look over the forecasts that they do, because we're not getting the details that we should be getting from the government. Uh, a case in point as well, if I just, one more sure. point, is that the main estimates for 2012-2013 came out before the budget. Now, I would submit that the budget should always come out before the main estimates because the main estimates need an economic and fiscal context in which Parliament can discuss them. That shouldn't be some outdated fall update that was presented six months ago. It should be the budget for the upcoming year. Okay, Melcap so is champing at the bit to get in here, but before well, he does... Let me, just, let me just one more thing. Okay, okay. in the 2012-2013 main estimates, uh, none of the expenditure reductions that were announced in the 2012 budget were included in those estimates. So you're asking hmm. parliamentarians now to approve right. estimates that are out of date already, uh, that are hmm. not reflective of the government's overall expenditure plan. Those, those cuts were not even shown in the supplementary estimates because the supplementary estimates just asked for increases in spending, not decreases in spending. And even when the reports of plans and priorities came out, much later than they would normally come out, the cuts still weren't there. So for a full year, Parliament went, went without knowing what the cuts were going to have or what impact they were going to have on individual departments, yet they were asked to approve the budgets of those departments. Just before Mel Cap responds, he should know what Mr. Page said at the editorial board meeting of the Ottawa Citizen when he said, are we weak in the public service right now in doing this stuff? Yes. Are they culpable and complicit? Yes. Is leadership weak when it comes to transparency? Yes. Does this have an impact on our country for democracy? Yes. It sounds like we need him because all these other institutions in democracy aren't doing their jobs very well. No? I, I'm not going to uh, uh, particularly address that, but I think you've got to look at this as a system. In the good old days, and you know the reason we have good old days is that we have bad memories, but the, in the good old days, we had uh, what Peter described as a fairly open approach, that when you create a parliamentary budget officer and you create a finance PBO conflict or, or contesting mm -hmm. uh, of what goes on, suddenly you, you, you change the behavior and incentives of people and how they perform. You change the incentives of MPs, change the incentives of the budget office, and change the incentive of finance officials and departmental officials. The, what Kevin described, uh, going to court to get information, which he has the statutory right to, I mean, it's in the act, it's not a, a, a goodwill effort, it's in the act, parliament has decreed. But when you do this, you're now in an adversarial position. It worked much better when it was the principle of finance giving the best estimates they had, putting that out to the public, having relationships with the media, having relationships with MPs, but being accountable to Parliament through the minister. Hmm. The minister was ultimately accountable, and having parliamentary ministerial accountability is fundamental to our system. We now have this adversarial role that changes behavior. Okay, there's been a, a, an expression that's come up a few times right now, and Laurie, I, again, I want to call on you as the resident political scientist here to give us the, uh, the handy-dandy definition of what we're talking about. Budgets seem to come forward now in the form of omnibus bills, where they throw everything, including the kitchen sink, in there. What's the significance of that in your view? Okay. So an omnibus bill is something that we often think of in the American context, and it is a piece of legislation that can cover a wide variety of things that don't seem to relate to each other necessarily, right? Like you can have, you know, all different types of policies, different change, like changes to different pieces of legislation that don't seem to be related all in one omnibus bill. And usually you get, you know, some huge thing that's hundreds of pages long. The effect in terms of what we're talking about here is that it would be very difficult to scrutinize that kind of bill because there's no narrative flow to it. You know, like you're not, you know, you're not moving from clause to clause on the same topic necessarily. It covers a wide variety of things. It's completely within the realm of the possible that, um, you know, a very conscientious scrutineer might still miss parts of it because 
there's just so there's so much substance in it, and it doesn't necessarily relate to each other. And so, if a government uses this kind of a of a, of a vehicle for a budget, then Parliament's ability to scrutinize becomes you know even more challenged, or the task of scrutiny becomes even more difficult because you're having to to pay even more attention to like you know moving from topic to topic kind of thing. Right. Kevin Page, how much of a problem did you have with omnibus bills when you were parliamentary budget officer? Well, I mean, as a parliamentary budget officer, yes, I mean, the recent budgets, we had massive omnibus bills, hundreds and hundreds of pages, dozens and dozens of acts, all moving, limited time periods to pass. It was uh, an effort to really, I think, to undermine Parliament. But if I could just go back to a point that Mel made with respect to the adversary that's in the system right now, I don't think it's created by the creation of a parliamentary budget officer. It's created when the government of the day and the public service thinks it's fine to have a budget, move into austerity, and not provide spending plans the way Peter Alec discussed. So we, even today, one year after budget 2012, again, if you look at those spending tables, and Peter, he memorizes them because he produced them for years, <laughs> you're talking about $15 billion coming off of a, a budget of about $120 billion, which is called direct program spending. That's a big amount of restraint on a limited size, on a big part of that budget, but it uh, has a significant impact. No spending plans by departments. So again, you are completely undermining Parliament when you do that. So if the Parliamentary Budget Officer doesn't stand up, and if that's deemed to be adversarial, I'm not apologizing for that either. All right. Mel Cap, let me get you on the omnibus bill situation. And before doing so, let me read what John Ibbotson had to say. This is actually going back to June of 2012 in the Globe and Mail. He said, governments like omnibus bills because they can shove a raft of controversial measures into one package and force them through early in a mandate and repair any political damage before the next election. Champions of the democratic process despair over such bills because they subvert Parliament's duty to examine the government's agenda and hold it to account. But we had an election on exactly this issue last year. The Liberals and NDP campaigned on the Tories' shoddy treatment of Parliament. The Conservatives campaigned on protecting the economy. A large plurality of voters chose the Conservatives. Does that make it right? It, it doesn't make it right. It makes it legal, le <laughs> le legitimate in yeah. some respects. But uh, I mean, what, what happens in the omnibus bills is that you have, and Kevin referred to it, time constraints on appropriations. So the, the reason the estimates are tabled in February and the budget doesn't come till March, and I agree with Peter, it should be, and Kevin, that it should be reversed, uh, that you should have the, es the budget out there before the estimates. But you need the estimates tabled by the end of February to trigger a standing order of the House to get them passed and force a vote. Otherwise, MPs and public servants and nobody else gets paid. Mm -hmm. So if you want the salary bill to be paid, you better get them in by the end of February, and that's why the estimates get tabled then. Well, if you have an Appropriation Act that throws in a bunch of other stuff, policy initiatives that may have been announced, the budget bill that throws in other in initiatives, all of a sudden you get Parliament being forced to act on everything rather than being able to pick out separate items. In the U.S., even the U.S. has moved to a line item veto, and uh, we, we don't have that. Does the president have a line item veto in the states? Well, I think uh, some governors do. I'm not sure the yeah, president does. Yeah, I'm not does. sure the president does. Yeah. All right, let's, with just a few minutes left here, I want to find out if there is, since you've all, you, you've all basically decried the way things are, and what I want to know is, in whose interest will it be to fix this? Do you have any views on this? It's the interest of the country. It's the interest of Parliament. But they can't it's do not it. necessarily the interest of the government of the day. So it will have to be a political issue. Is it hard to correct the system? No. We could look at the process. We could incent MPs to do their jobs better. We're giving them a rule to actually change the estimates. Can we change the structure of the estimates from these you know, ancient you know, capital input votes to something like program activities where we can organize information better? Yes. Can we level the playing field? Yes. We can have proactive disclosure of financial information from departments. And I think that would fundamentally change the system, and it's all very doable. The reason why we don't do it because I think the executive thinks it's in their interest not to do it. The public service thinks that it's in their interest not to do it. Peter, we've seen so often in politics that where you stand depends on where you sit. We know the conservatives thought one thing in opposition. They've taken another approach now that they're the government. The NDP is very much on Kevin Page's side now that they're in the opposition. If they were to win the next election, who knows? Would they change their mind on this? Who's going to lead this charge? Well, that's hard to say um, uh, what they would do. We saw what the Conservatives did uh, when pre-election and post-election in 2006. I think that the NDP in this case here would support an independent parliamentary budget uh, office. Um, I think that's sort of within their, what they would call within their mandate. Uh, I think that, you know, they, 
Over the last, I would say, 20 years, there have been three studies looking at uh, the, the estimates process. Uh, these studies produced something like over 90 recommendations of only which a couple were ever enacted. So <laughs> the, the committee seemed to be willing to at least examine themselves, but then at the end of the day, as Kevin said, they don't appear to be willing to enact any of those recommendations. And that largely comes from the executive branch. I admit that I don't quite agree with the public service. I think the public service is a very um, well able and aggressive public service, but over the last few years, uh, they have been clamped. They have been forced to, to go to the back room in some sense. Policies, decisions, and analysis is not really done by them. They don't have the same role today as what they were playing in the past. And I think that's a real shame. I think if you had a more dynamic public service which uh, informs the, the government, um, the, um, the executive branch and, and the various ministers, uh, rather than having to take orders, have the debate. We haven't had a good debate, I think, on any of the major issues uh, since 2007. Uh, when one looks at uh, Kevin's reports when they come out, what is the reaction that we get from the government? Well, they're unreliable, uh, they're inaccurate, um, they're incredible, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we don't have a debate as to why are they that. Uh, at one point in time, we did have that type of debate. The department would put out its own analysis so somebody could criticize it, could question them on it. Okay, Peter, I'm going to jump in here debate. for a second because I've got 30 seconds left and I want to save it for Mel Cap. Is this ever going to get changed? Well, I agree with everything that Kevin and Peter said. I, I think that it's very um, important for the, the, the opposition to have the system working. And as soon as the opposition gets into government, it isn't quite as important as it used to be. So there can be incentives. We need to move to them. I want to thank everybody for coming in tonight and having this conversation with us here at TVO. Peter DeVries, the independent consultant, formerly of the Department of Finance uh, in our nation's capital, along with Lori Turnbull, the professor of political science at Dalhousie University. We've uh, been appreciated. We have appreciated having you on the program uh, from our nation's capital. Uh, Mel Cap, the former clerk of the Privy Council, now professor at the School of Public Policy and Governance at the U of T, and the now unemployed Kevin Page, former parliamentary budget officer. And we wish you well with your future, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.